History happened everywhere. The verdict. This is our after show podcast where we look back at the most recent episode, Riddle in Columbia during 1930 to 1940. So if you haven't listened to that, go back and check it out or else there will be spoilers ahead. Are you sure about that? My name is Ryan Weir, and I am here in the studio with the Gorshin to my west. It's the very puzzling Peter Goddard. What? What's that now? <laughs> <laughs> Frank Gorshin, he played the Riddler, and Adam West played Batman in oh, the 1966 I see. Batman. I very that good. Was very clever. That was very clever. <laughs> There'll be some people out there going, oh. <laughs> uh. And we are joined as ever by the deluxe diamond of durability. It's the judge himself. It's Mr. Paul Dursley. Yes, hello. How are you doing, Paul? I'm not too bad, thank you. It's been a long time, Mr. Bond. <laughs> it's been a long old time. Nothing could be worse than the judge sitting there waiting. Stewing on a bad grade to give to somebody. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, yes, one has to take into account you have had a very long time to prepare this episode. <laughs> very true, He's very true. this judge. <laughs> anyway, look, Peter, why don't you help summarise episode 56 for me and the audience in, let's say, 60 seconds starting now we swanned off to South America to the beautiful and mega diverse country of Colombia with an O not a U we discovered the history of the country from early man to massive Spanish land holding to the loss of Panama making the country we know today we learned about the tough lives of the banana workers and the strike that ended in a massacre we found out about the private invasion of Colombia that became a war against Peru and we discovered the novel legal approach of claiming defense of military honor that enabled one man to literally get away with murder and on the way we solved some pretty tricky riddles too Last week's episode done, summarised nicely, nice one son, now we're over to a young Dursley who's gonna tell you what he thought of me, he'll take you apart without any care, he's the lovely Paul Dursley, the lovely Paul Dursley. You set some very tricky riddles I'd for say us, borderline people. impossible. <laughs> <laughs> How did you fare with the riddles, Paul? I have to be honest, I'm not a great riddler. I like to think my USP was riddles that require a very specific knowledge of a very specifically Colombian history, which added it to the challenge somewhat. <laughs> Although the banana one was pretty simple. Yeah, I got that one, didn't I? Can't have been that hard. Ah, but I, uh, but I, I did get the more complex. I wasn't sure of the exact name, but it was the fruit company. Uh, ah. I, I could because they have had dealings in a n lot of South America and the Caribbean. It's funny you should say that, actually, because in the episode I said, well, I talked about banana republics and where they originated and we weren't sure if it was Colombia or a general thing. Mm -hmm. But I looked it up a bit more specifically. And in fact, it was Honduras. It was a, a term coined by a writer called O. Henry, who lived in Honduras for six months. And he, uh, it, was, it was Chiquita. Not Henry O. Uh it's O. Henry, isn't it? Oh, am I getting my chocolate bars and my writers mixed up? <laughs> I, I, I don't know. It just seems like one of those names. O. Henry seems more like a name than Henry O. That sounds like an Irish name. <laughs> o. Henry. <laughs> <laughs> Henry O. Henry. <laughs> anyway, uh, so it was specifically coined for Honduras and also Guatemala was very, was very well known as one of these types of countries. But now it's more generally used for anything with a bit of a captured government, I suppose, captured so, by business. Okay, so... So Honduras, Guatemala, they all had a monopsony too? They had the United Fruit Company there, actually. It was the same company, just operating in different countries, okay. causing the problems. So they had a monopsony everywhere. But they tried, I Did think. they have a monopoly of monopsonies? <laughs> <laughs> I'm surprised you didn't know that word. Oh, I was just going to ask if you knew the word, but that was a <laughs> stupid thing to even try and ask you. Yeah. Yeah. No, neither of us knew it, right? Correct. Monopsony. I like it, though. That's I've been saying word, it all week. I just say it to myself occasionally. Uh, well, uh, of course, there was another banana company in that region. Do we get bonus points if we know it? Yes. Let's see if you do know it. Fife's. Oh, exactly. Fife's bananas. Well Woo! done. Points. <laughs> That's because you've done all the research. <laughs> Bound to have come up. Because sort of Fife's bananas owned all the bananas on all the British ex-British colonies there, which the Americans didn't try to take over. So you should always buy British and buy Fife's bananas, not Chiquita bananas. This podcast was brought to you by Fife's bananas, the better banana. <laughs> <laughs> 
There are people out there that collect those little stickers, aren't they? Like stamps. Yeah, that is a perplexing hobby to me. I'm going to look it up and see if there's a name for people who collect fruit stickers. I mean, I have a name for them. (laughs) It might not be one for sharing on the podcast. I think it may be the same name as me. There's a former greengrocer who's collected 30,000 of them. But they're all the same, aren't they? No, they're not all the same. There's loads of them, apparently. I mean, I guess it's different fruit, right? It's not just bananas. He probably has a banana section. Oh, there's a picture of him here. It sounds like an orchestra, the banana section. (laughs) And the coconuts for the percussion. Apparently he's got one tattooed on his body. Of course he does. But which one? That's a choice he has to make. Chiquita, Fife, other banana... You were going to say manufacturers. I was. I was was going And then I thought importers, (laughs) exporters. Okay, so there are a number of these banana banana, peddlers. Banana people. Yeah, they don't just peddle bananas, Pete. They also peddle spiders. Oh. Yeah. In 2011, a taxi driver in London bought a bunch of bananas from his local supermarket. He opened the sealed plastic bag and out crawled a yellow spider. Yeah. In 2014, a housewife in Poole in England also bought a bag of bananas. Inside was a Colombian spider. In 2021, two cases were reported, one of which was a supermarket shopper, a guy called Adam Shepard in Eastbourne. He found a spider in the bananas and he said i wasn't really that shocked as i used to work produce for tesco the supermarket and i've seen it happen quite a few times that's less reassuring than his breezy (laughs) devil may care demeanor suggests it's only a spider well that's the thing right and in fact most colombian spiders are indeed non-venomous they're harmless to humans but (laughs) the one to avoid and the one that does keep getting into these banana bags is the banana spider aka the brazilian wandering spider aka the murderous oh my lord well he certainly gets the wandering name if he's coming here from brazil (laughs) five thousand miles yeah Yeah, it's amazing that they survive right when you think but yeah of of all the animals the dangerous animals in colombia the banana spider is top of the list if provoked it will give you a nasty toxic bite it can have a 15 centimeter leg span (laughs) it's a big spider yeah they go for a walk at night and they find their way into clothes shoes bedding tents and equipment so soldiers in the colombia's army me, they put socks over the tops of their boots to stop these things crawling in. You should always check your boots in the jungle before you put them on. They do say that if you find eggs on your bananas, because apparently more so than actually finding a spider, you'll just find eggs attached to the bananas. And the advice is the best thing to do is to wash them off. And if you're really worried, you could put them in the freezer to kill them and then just enjoy your banana. I think just throw the banana away. I'm thinking about burning my house down as a re- reaction to this. <laughs> Maybe an overreaction, I grant you. But that is the very definition of unexpected item in bagging area isn't it <laughs> <There> is... <laughs> I want I want that to be played at my funeral when they wheel the coffin in <laughs> I think I think you missed a pretty obvious fact Peter oh really Well, yes, it's a trans-equatorial country. That's an interesting fact. Trans-equatorial? Yeah, it used to be equatorial, but now it's uh, polar. (laughs) 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 So what does that actually mean? It means that it's both north and south of the equator. Yes, it crosses the equator. That's kind of cool. So the water goes one way, one way, and then goes one way, the other way. Let's not go there, please. (laughs) Drags up physics myths. Oh, dear, oh, dear. Uh, No, I did not include that fact. There are a number of facts I didn't include, partly because we ran out of time. We, in fact, had to cut a very interesting section about the game Teho. We did indeed, yeah. There was also 25 solid minutes of the episode that was also cut. Ah, yes. We had a little... (laughs) A little snafu in the recording, didn't we? Where we chattered along for quite a substantial chunk of time. 25 minutes. 25 minutes before we realised we weren't actually recording anything. (laughs) Can I just replay that, how that goes? That went, hey Pete, should I be recording this? (laughs) (laughs) So there is out there, Paul, another version which needs to be graded, but uh, we don't have it recorded. Oh, it was terrific, that version too. It was was the best one. (laughs) Okay, so... So I need to mark you down then because you've had a second go at this. 
yeah, I think we definitely deserve some competence demerits <laughs> as a result of that particular travesty of podcasting. To be fair, I spilt my beer and that was what knocked the button that stopped us recording. So yeah. I will accept the minus points. Well, we'll see how that affects the score at the end. But I did want to bring back the game of Teho that we talked about. Tell us about Teho. So Teho is a game a little bit like bowls, but probably more like... Have you ever heard of the game Cornhole? It's an American game where they throw bean bags into a hole on a sort of angled piece of wood. No. But there are, there are, you know, there are many a ball as well where you're chucking balls to hit a target, basically, right? Do they win a goldfish as well? Well, you win something very exciting in Teho. Mm. So what happens is you, you stand on a kind of a court, an alley, I suppose you might call it. I don't know what the word is. And you're about 18 and a half metres away from this uh, box, which is uh, kind of at a 45 degree angle, and it's filled with clay. And in the middle of the box filled with clay is a tube that you're aiming to chuck what is a metal disc, a lump of metal into it. Mm. So this is the, basically it. So, so you sort of coits. Yeah, very similar to that sort of thing. But the thing that makes it interesting and uh, exciting is the around the centre, they have things called uh, matcha, I think they were called, and they are envelopes of gunpowder. So if you get your thing right next to the hole, bang, you can blow up the, the envelope and boom, you get extra points and an exciting thrill. I say. It's the element of danger that makes it fun, I think, for me. Well, it's not that dangerous if it's 18 metres away from you, is it? Well, you don't know how much gunpowder is in it. <laughs> it is kind of more of a snap than a boom, I must admit. But I thought a couple of things. One, we both agreed that there are many games that could only be improved by the addition of bags of gunpowder at various locations. Basketball. For, for sure. Doing a slam dunk on a basket. Formula One. For, oh, my Lord. So you want it for the crashes, but mm. also the explosions. <laughs> Uh, so, yeah, we thought we'd bring Teho to Croydon. We'll set up a Teho alley and uh, bring it to the masses. Because the other excellent thing about Teho is traditionally it is played whilst drinking beer. Because that's what you want, explosives and beer. Great combination. So it's a bit like darts. A bit like darts, but more boom. Less fingers. <laughs> uh, fewer fingers, actually. So what else have you got from the cut episode, Peter? So this wasn't cut, but I did. I removed it for time purposes. There is a mystery, a genuine mystery, like a riddle. Yeah, it's a, it's an, it's an archaeological site in a place called San Augustin, which in 1931 was made an archaeological park. Hmm. And it's got lots of funeral mounds, it's got lots of statues, it's got chambers. But what's interesting about it is they have no idea the people who made it put it there, what they did with it. It's just abandoned. It's a site. Nobody knows who put it there. Do they have dates for it? They have some dates. They think they go back as far as 1000 BC. Aliens. (laughs) (laughs) I mean, come on. That's got to be at least top of the list then, if no one knows. I mean, uh, that is your go-to explanation for most things. Uh, They didn't mention aliens, funnily enough. It just suggested it was a culture that came along, lived its life, and then disappeared either by moving away or all dying out, I guess. So they would have been aliens, technically, if they came in and then left. Uh, yeah, but there's all sorts of stuff there, and it, you can visit it today. And it's uh, there's all these it's really big carvings, and it's it's quite impressive, but a total mystery. Nobody knows where it came from, who did it. That's really odd that they don't know who the likely candidates are. So I, I guess they didn't have much, they didn't have any written language then, because if there was a written language, there'd be some some hook to go on. That is strange. I want to go now. There you go. That's uh, something for you to do. Uh, This week, there was a new story about a pyramid in Bolivia that researchers have discovered tunnels underneath using LIDAR, right? They discovered this network of tunnels that's underneath the pyramid. They didn't know was there. And they discovered this in 2019, so just before the pandemic. So they've been sitting there waiting for two years. Wow. And they finally went in and they sent a drone robot car thing in there. They found little pots, pottery with animal creatures on it. But then they found in the center at this room that has football-sized clay balls that are painted and they don't know what they're there for or why they were there. They're just on the floor. It's just laid out. Yeah, laid out on the floor. It's the weirdest thing. Alien eggs. It could be alien eggs. I think you should go, Ryan. I'd have to send Harrison Ford. Yeah. Yeah. That, That is absolute Raiders of the Lost Ark stuff, isn't it? Isn't it great? Yeah.
So the other thing I was I was tempted to talk about, but just didn't in the end, is kind of just how the Liberals went about doing their thing. So uh, when they came to power in 1930, ousting the Conservatives who'd been around for 16 solid years, they mm-hmm. had a, a bit of a culture war going on. So they one of the things they did was they sponsored workers' choirs. Right. So if you formed a workers' choir, they would support you and send you funds to sing along, I guess. The idea was to bring culture to the masses, but it was also to they were trying to stimulate a Colombian culture as opposed to previously there'd been a kind of a Eurocentric, Europhile snobbery about culture. Hmm. So all the good stuff was classical music from Europe and the more native indigenous arts were ignored. But the liberals wanted to bring back the local culture. So yeah, they created these things called Orfeones Obreros, which are choral groups uh, made of workers. But the other reason they wanted to do this was to compete with uh, shisha, which is a booze, basically. So they were trying to stop people going to the bar by setting up a chorus line. <laughs> not, not to be confused with shisha, the smoke. Smoking. Yeah, no, quite different. <laughs> yes, quite different. I chicha, that, I suppose it's maybe pronounced. Yeah, with maybe. Chicha. chicha. <laughs> that sounds more South America, doesn't it? Yeah, it, uh, I don't know how successful it was. I personally will probably stay at the bar, but I guess some people went for a nice song instead. We talked, though, didn't we, about uh, liberal versus conservative and how that does tend to sort of dominate politics globally, it seems. I mean, there are other political parties and other theories and things, but why do you think that liberal and conservative seems to be the thing that, that people latch on to and become the major parties? Well, I think there's it, it reflects a social division in part. Yeah, one it, it's who, not necessarily left or right it's collectivism versus individualism oh interesting well it's 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 well i think the whole thing of society is it's the balance of that it's difficult to get a society all at one end and difficult to get a society all at the other end of that spectrum but it's where in the middle do you draw the line i think there is a natural human tension between individual success and recognizing merit Mm-hmm. which would be claimed by the more conservative wing. So talking about, you know, there are separate, such separations in society, but because people are differently abled. And then the, the other side of it being collective care. So society looks after each other. Mm. Everyone gets, should have at least a chance in life and an education or the basic food and shelter. So I think it, there's a natural tension between community looking after each other and individuals trying to excel for themselves. And there's always a little bit of balance to be had there because... And uh, if you go back, I suppose, to you know early times where there were tribes of people, small groups or small communities, in general, you have to look after your tribe, right? You, you're part of that team. You have your role or your place within that community. But then there would be a leader or someone. There would be a headman or a chief family. And uh, so, yeah, I think that's a a natural human tension, isn't it? Tension, yes, is one word. But also, I I think it's sort of just like a natural human tendency that most people would not want to make all the decisions. So they'd be quite happy to let somebody else make some of the decisions. And there would always be people who would like to be able to make those decisions. But it's not just a human thing, though, is it? Like, if you look at a pride of lions, they'll be the one that's in charge, the alpha, that will always want to be in charge. But they also work together to share the meat and at the end of a hunt. So it's an innate part of nature. Everyone wants to get ahead individually, I suppose, but also everyone has a better chance if everyone looks after each other. I think everybody should. Well, look after you each know, other. Not, 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 lots of the arguments are sort of the D- Richard Dawkins argument is it's genetic, isn't it? You are favouring the genes of your kind, whether A, it's your family, or B, at a wider extent, your country, or C, humanity. I would fight for humanity against the aliens when they come back to reclaim San Augustine. <laughs> not when they hatch from those. <laughs> Spheres. Spheres. <laughs> so, can we talk about Tour de France winner Igan Bernal? Yes, the Tour de France winner 2019 from Recollection. That's right. He was the youngest person ever to win the Tour de France. He was also the first person from Colombia to win the Tour de France. That happened in 2019. Uh, But I did want to talk about uh, more recently. And uh, this was in January this year. Uh, Igan was on a training ride with his teammates in Colombia. uh, And he hit the back of a stopped passenger bus at 50 kilometers per hour. That's 31 miles per hour. He suffered a fractured vertebrae, a fractured right femur, a fractured right patella, chest trauma, 
had Oof. a punctured lung and several rib fractures. Oh, my Lord. Yeah, I mean, this bus was just parked and up on the side. And he got up and cycled on. Well, no, not quite. Unfortunately not. No, the, the doctors there, he was taken to hospital and the doctors counted 20 different fractures and initially warned there was a 95% chance that Banal would die or be paralysed. Wow. He was in a bad, bad way. So it was parked and he just went straight into the back of it. Uh, he underwent two surgeries, both of which were successful. And by the next day, he was stabilised, um, but in intensive care. By March, he was tweeting to his fans pr uh, pictures of his progress. And as of the 16th of August, two days as of this recording, he returned to racing, taking part in the Denmark Rund. Oh, good on him. Well done, mate. How about that? So there you go. Tour de France winner, Egan Bernal. Good luck to you. Yeah, quite so. Brave. I can just take the bus. It sounds safer. <laughs> That's what he tried to do. <laughs> Peter, you mentioned cocaine and you said that we didn't really want to talk about it because it's not the kind of thing that, that we wanted to talk negatively about a country. But I did a little research on this because I thought, well, actually, you know what? Cocaine used to be like a, a medicine. It was considered. Yes. Uh, it was used in Coca-Cola and in other products. So I thought, well, as an export within Colombia specifically during 1930, I thought, well, perhaps you were wrong. Perhaps it was actually another export. And it, it wasn't. It was just... <laughs> <laughs> it a lot was, of build up there. <laughs> it was still regulated heavily. But what I did discover is in during the 1930s, the biggest exporter of cocaine was, what do you think? I'm going to say Vietnam. Germany or the United States? It, it was neither of those. It was, in fact, Japan. Oh, really? The greatest exporter of, of cocaine during the, I think, 1910 to 1930. Wow. How about that? And then sort of South America took that crown from them. But Great Britain was in the list as well. Oh, we, really? We grow a lot of cocaine, apparently. Then we've got such a different climate. That really surprises me. Well, it might not have been grown in this country. We did have some substantial holdings at the time. <laughs> substantial holdings, yes. That's <laughs> certainly one way of putting it. Do you have anything else? Yeah. The other thing I didn't mention was in the Andes, or east of the Andes, in fact, in uh, central Colombia, mm. there was a river that they called the Liquid Rainbow. Oh, that's nice. Right? That's lovely, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, apparently it's... Uh, Covered in petroleum. <laughs> no, it's not. It's uh, during some months of the year. It's not all the time. It gets all these shades of different colours, red, blue, yellow, orange and green, mm -hmm. rainbowy, right? Yeah. And it's a natural thing that happens because of an aquatic plant called Macarania clavigera, which under certain conditions with the right water levels and sunlight, it kind of turns different colours. So the river takes on this kind of rainbow hues because of this plant. That's cool. I, that's now on my bucket list. All right, we'll put it on the list. We'll go to... We'll, uh, certainly Colombia was a place that I fancied going after doing my mm. research. I'd like to go to Colombia. Columbia. Should we go? Should we go to Columbia? Yeah, why not? Cool. Yeah, when a nice man asks you to take a couple of packages back for him, the answer Ryan is no. <laughs> yes. Isn't that a rather funny place to store packages? <laughs> I was well, with the cost of carry-on luggage these days. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I was reading about the modern drug baron in Colombia. He hides his cocaine in live animals. <laughs> so he exports live animal, exotic animals to other countries and puts the cocaine inside of them. But surely yeah. if you know Isn't that. Isn't that pretty easy to stop? <laughs> Would you probe a lion? <laughs> well, there's, there's his hippos, his 40 hippos. Maybe yeah. that's what he did, did it for. They could store quite a bit, couldn't they? Hungry, hungry hippos. <laughs> <laughs> And so, we have come to the end of the line. It's time to step into the dock, my friend, and prepare to face the people's judge. Was that dramatic? That was very dramatic. <laughs> yeah. I'm slightly nervous about this one, if I'm honest, but let's see how it goes. All right. Judge Dursley, are you ready to give your verdict? Yes, I am. Then, will the defendant rise? Your Honour, as usual, may we start proceedings by first asking for your verdict on factual content. The episode sort of covered a country where I didn't know that much about it, actually, especially, especially in this period. I sort of knew all the history about Gran Colombia and, and, and sort of all the Simon Bolivar and all of that, which you never mentioned. Uh, 
So that's a negative, isn't it? <laughs> so in, in terms of factual content, I have to assume that it is correct. Would you have liked more facts? Was, was facts sufficient? Stocked with facts? Oh, it was fact packed. I always would have liked more facts. I think for factual content, I'll have to give you a B minus. Mm, acceptable. That's very good. So, Your Honour, we move to our next category, entertainment value. How entertained were you by episode 56? Not that much, to be honest. Because uh, the, the honest thing is, I can't really remember them. I knew doing a superhero sketch was going to be uh, land us in hot water with the judge. I'm afraid I'm going to have to give you a C. C? That's okay. I'm not devastated. Okay, uh, Your Honour, then finally, uh, category three, Dursley Factor. Did this tickle the Dursley bones? Yes, it did. I was titillated and excited by your facts, especially about the trapezium. Ah, yes. The little bit of land that sticks down from Colombia that Peru felt was more Peruvian than that. <laughs> yeah. So uh, may I please have your verdict on Dursley Factor? The Dursley Factor is... I think I'll give you a B plus for that. A B plus? I'm very impressed. Peter, before the judge passes his verdict, you have an opportunity to enter a plea. If you choose to do so, please make that plea now. I am saying nothing. I think I've already achieved more than I could ever have hoped for, so I'm keeping stum, sir. Very good. Your Honour, the defendant stands before you with a silenced mouth. Have you reached a verdict? Yes, I have. In which case, I would ask most respectfully for your ruling. So, I was going to give a slightly higher score. However, certain facts have emerged during the recording of this episode. <laughs> Meaning you had a long run-up, first of all, yes. and also a second chance. So I, instead of giving you what I was going to give you, I will give you a B. Oh, a straight B. A B, that's good. I'm taking that. And then I'm shutting up again. Yeah. <laughs> oh, of course, I've got. I've, I've been told also to carry forward a couple of minus points to your next one, haven't I? <laughs> yes. It was just one <laughs> minus point, not a couple. <laughs> just saying. Yeah, let's hopefully, hopefully you'll forget. The judge in his old age will forget. So there you go, Peter. Well done. Another episode down and a, and a straight B for you. That's great. Now it's over to you, isn't it? Yeah, well rewarded, I think. That was an excellent episode. So yes, it is my turn next. Episode 57. We return and uh, we're heading into Burkina Faso. And we're going to be looking at fear a long, long time ago. I always score these esoteric time periods very low. Well, it's a Ryan episode. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so shall we just cut to the chase? <laughs> no, I'm afraid we have to wait for the next verdict. But uh, okay. I would rather you listen to it first. <laughs> okay, so that is it for the show for this week. Thank you all for listening. If you'd like to get in touch about any of the things that we've talked about on this show, or you just want to say hello, you can do that by reaching out to us on social media or through our website at hhepodcast.com or by email at pete and ryan at hhepodcast.com yeah we'd love to hear from you and you might end up featured on a future show if you tell us something fascinating to share with everyone and one way to definitely feature on a future episode is to rate and review the show on apple Podcasts and on spotify Podcasts. your recommendation can really help us bring the show to new listeners yeah and if you're on tiktok instagram facebook or twitter you can find us we are at hhe podcast uh, if you subscribe to those you'll get an alert when we post one of our one minute animated bites and we're going to be back again very soon but in the meantime time a huge thank you to the judge himself thank you paul my pleasure and that's it i guess all that's left to say is you've been listening to can you knock us up some gunpowder paul for our Tejo game um not gu not gunpowder i could i could do ammonium triiodide what's that do does that explode yes okay did you make it at school 
I mean, we used to have a physic, a chemistry teacher who sort of said, "You mustn't do this, but this is how to do it." <laughs> in many ways, there was no explosive making in my in my school for some reason. The curriculum was lacking basic anarchist cookbook material. <laughs> no, we just had the serial killer teachers, the ones that wanted us to chop up animals. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, we, we, so we said to, to this, we made a hydrogen bomb once. That seems like a step up. <laughs> they did things different in 1920, didn't they, Paul? Yeah. Yes, so, well, you could have made this hydrogen bomb in 1920 because all it was was a bottle full of hydrogen, but you exploded it, so technically it was a hydrogen bomb. <laughs> <laughs> I love this school that you went to. Well, no, ammonium triiodide was used quite a lot in the past. It's a sort of a purply powder. Well, it's, it's sort of like a conglomeration of powder, but it's very unstable. So all you need to do is put a little bit of pressure on and it goes bang. And then you can apply the iodine to the wound afterwards. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, it's two in one. If you can do it to a Labrador, you can do it to a president. That's my view.